Good afternoon. My name is Tim Markle. I'm director of the Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs, and this is Conversations on Showing Up for Kids. We are excited today that we have Ms. Lola Dada Ali uh, with us, and I met Lola months ago, but, you know, basically, she she is somebody that Im Im impresses me, but all the more so she's somebody I like to talk to. And so I just figured maybe you guys wanted to talk to her too. So Lola, I, I, I could go on the bio, but the main thing is, is that I love the Not Your Mama's Autism podcast. Um, I love when I hear you speak. I know you're a speaker, you're an author, you're a mom, you're a sister, you're, you live life. And thank you so much for sharing a little bit of that life with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you really and truly for having me. I think I see Lori on the call. Lori. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So How's Lori's that? making, yeah. <laughs> She's making sure that I'm not like snowballing her for, you know, the conference coming up. It's like, okay, is she real? Is she real? You know, because that's my rep, Lola. Um, you know, that's my rep. We talked about that, that earlier. Um, so Lola, the I know that when I last saw you talk, and I, I know that we've talked a couple of times, but you use this phrase, brokering hope, and that you want to be a hope broker, and you look for people who want to be hope brokers. And that just fascinates me, because in the world that I'm surrounded in, um, when I'm not with my friends, or at a, you know, when work is going well, or when I'm not with my family, it seems to me this world could use a little more hope and a few more people brokering hope. So can you just, I, I give you full reign. If you want to just dive right in there, if you want to give a little bit of your background story, whatever you would like to do, um, I'm honored you're with us. Thank you again. Thank you all for having me. And maybe we should do some level setting in case uh, people don't know my personal story. So I am on a multi-generational autism and disability journey. So what that looks like is I'm the older sister to an autistic and intellectually disabled man. We grew up at a time when people were still using the R word, where people were a lot less inclusive, a lot less kind. And we grew up together and that obviously changes all types of family dynamics that I'm sure the Weissman Center is very well versed in helping people better understand. But it molded me in ways I, I didn't really understand at the time. Um, I actually thought they were quite disjointed, but the older I got, the more I saw that, at least in my particular life, Growing up with my brother would become the foundation of so many decisions in my life and so many really valuable life lessons. So growing up with my baby brother, um, I didn't know I would then become the mom of two kids on the autism spectrum themselves. I didn't know that um, one would not only look like almost exactly like my brother, the family joke is that I somehow just birthed the daughter that my brother never had. They're very similar. She too has an intellectual disability. But imagine just, um, my brother can be described as a somewhat burly, big teddy bear, but with the innocence of a toddler. And then if you could imagine now the female, more sassy, more slightly more verbal version, but growing up in an era where she just has so many more supports. Um, it is truly a fascinating journey that I'm on. And I think fascinating is the right word. Um, not perfect, not easy, not... I learned so much from my kids and I learned so much from my brother and things even growing up with my brother, I'm unlocking through the raising of my children. It's just the deja vu has deja vu. So we're talking about hope today. And I love the word hope. I find that word too, just having so many layers because in the definition of hope, 
and forgive me, I'm a lawyer by profession, so I like definitions. Let me just read it off real quick. According to Merriam-Webster, it's desire accompanied by the expectation of or belief in fulfillment. And what I find so interesting about the word hope is that desire is a foundational component. It's an action. And not to be confused with toxic positivity. I'm not out here saying, oh, I'm going to fall asleep and become a size two and my children will sleep through the night. And well, Lola, is toxic positivity actually a thing? I've, I don't know if I've heard toxic positivity before, but I love it. It is a thing. It's coming up um, in psychology circles because of the advent of social media, because we are becoming more and more pressured as a people, as a society. And this is across cultures, because I sit um, in this intersection of coming from a West African family, growing, being born and growing up in the state. So I see this cross-culturally and along my other friends. Of course, this is the time that um, <laughs> the sprinklers turn on, so I apologize. <laughs> But um, you see this across cultures of this need. There's a difference between putting your best foot forward and acting as though adversity never comes. And I think sometimes with the advent of social media, we go a little bit too deep into everything's always fine. I'm always hydrated. My skin, there's no pimples. Like, I'm, I may be in my 50s or 60s, but I magically look like I'm in my 20s, but I've had no plastic surgery, like all those types of things. It's getting to the point where we are comparing ourselves to the highlight reel of other people's lives. And if you live a life like mine, like a lot of people who I suspect are on this call, it's a setup for this form of just mental torture that really you don't have to put yourself in. It's not always easy to get yourself out of, but I think if we do it consistently, it helps the whole family because for some of us caretaking or caregiving is for a season, for others it's for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And if you know it's for a lifetime, what can you do to ensure that your mental health is pristine, despite all of the societal challenges. And I feel like um, measuring yourself against what society views as success can be that setup for failure when it doesn't have to be. So that's why I broker in hope because I'm very countercultural in a lot of ways. Um, I don't do well with things like mommy shaming or mommy guilt. There was a well-meaning friend that came over one day and she saw me, um, I, I took out, there was guacamole already made because I didn't have time to like mash the avocados. And she walked in, she goes, oh my God, you won't even smash the avocados. And I stopped her right there. I said, honey, I don't have time to be shamed. I'm not gonna be guilty. You're even lucky there's food. <laughs> you should just be happy there's food. And she was so taken aback by my authenticity, like by, she just started laughing. And we actually became good friends. She's one of my closest friends now. And she said, that was so refreshing. And I didn't realize that I was stressing you out by my comments. So she's even told me that she makes those comments less and less because she realizes the effect it could have on another mother, particularly another woman. That's a whole nother conversation for another day, right? But that's an yeah, example. Probably with a different host. <laughs> Perhaps, or not, or not. Or not. Hashtag allyship, or not, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Oh, man, man, man. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. That's just an example of, and it's hard some days. I mean, my daughter, the last two, three days, she's not slept very well. Uh, my coffee is definitely stronger than usual. But I try and find those one or two things in a day that keep me going because I have in the back of my mind that this is a lifetime journey. That m my ability to live this life as well as I can, given whatever restraints I have, helps out another human being. 
So oh, what are some, what are, what are, so there's a couple of things in the chat. I love this group. Um, so I'm going to ask my question at the end, but um, somebody commented that toxic positivity is totally a thing, which leads me to believe that I'm getting older and is often used by providers who think they're being helpful. In my mm -hmm. opinion, I think that's an interesting thought that the providers who are just like, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, or it'll work out, or maybe even going back to the, um, they'll grow out of it. Um, you know, don't worry, you don't need to have any screening done. Um, also, Lori's coffee is usually cold, totally understand that. <laughs> um, and then I'm wondering, could you give us some examples of what it is when when that life is starting, when your 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 coffee isn't strong enough and your daughter isn't sleeping, what are the things that you then grab a hold of to help get you through the day? I own that moment. I've learned um, in a really bad way that if you keep it in for too long, my body literally reacts. Uh, in, in 2019, I had to take a trip to the emergency room. And I can say this because I'm I'm consenting, lawyer me, I'm self-consenting. Um, I ended up in the ER with elevated high blood pressure because I had been internalizing too much. So I have learned to own that moment and know that, okay, this is this day, at least in this moment right now, it's not good. And it depends on the time I have, quite frankly. I'm I'm so attuned to knowing that these times will come that I don't. I don't always see it as a bad thing. I see it as part of the journey. So if I'm having a particularly rough, a rough day and I have the time, I will just walk into my closet, close the door. Sometimes I'll scream. Sometimes I'll pray. Sometimes I'll pray and scream, scream, pray. Um, I've learned to, if I have that ability to own the moment, I just own the moment. And I feel so much better and then I just keep moving. And it's, it's worked tremendously. Uh, a good example, because I have about 75 jobs. I've joked with Tim in the past. Um, my, my, my immigrant mom was very good at, my brother has multiple jobs too. I don't know why we do this, but I think it's like conditioned. So in the morning, my daughter had a moment. My husband and I actually had to leave our jobs and go tend to her at school. So we dealt with that situation, came back, and I just kept on legally advising my clients like the morning hadn't happened. But in the car ride there and back, I meditated, I prayed, I got myself prepared to go back into work mode. And again, just owning the moment that this was hard. And the more I've been able to do that, the more I've been able to navigate in multiple spaces. I've also... My no a-hole policy game is quite strong. So I've also, wherever I can, I self-select. Um, I live in, I think, one of the more well-to-do counties in the state. So there are certain people that believe that they got certain places in life completely on their own and they're just magical. I try and stay away from those humans because I'm aware of, regardless of your ability level, we are all products of, of our environments. So I personally attest to, but for the grace of God go I. So I try and keep my tribe like that, whether or not they be where I live now, where I used to live in Wisconsin, Illinois, DC, I've lived in multiple places, but I try and self-select. I'm. I think that's a form of privilege. I get that you can't always self-select, but I think the older I get, the more I see the importance of as much as you can being around people who get it. And when I mean get it, some people live my life but still don't get it. I mean people who have the empathy capacity, if that's a term, to see how I live and embrace me and see how my kids are and embrace us. So if you spend a lot of time um, wanting to look a certain way and act a certain way, but then the more I get to know you, those two things match, do not do not match, I should say, I start to self-select because I know that you probably won't accept my whole family either because we don't fit. 
is- exactly. And that whole empathy capacity, Lola, capacity, I just I just love because sometimes it takes a while to get to know someone where you realize they're not going to have empathy for you. They're not going to understand your life. They're not going to be able to feed your soul. They're not going to be able to to be someone you can count on when you're having a bad time. They may commiserate with you and they may agree that it's a horrible time, but they're doing nothing to help you lift it up. And we can only have so many of those people in our lives before we get totally drained. Exactly. And we need life givers. We need those hope brokers who remind us that, yeah, it sucks right now. But guess what? Maybe in a minute it may not. So I'm going to call out the moment you said the hope brokers or hope, hope multipliers. I feel like providers can be in this very unique position where they could actually multiply hope because they tend to be around our families for long periods of time over a duration of years. And um, I want to give a shout out to Amy Lyle at, at the Weissman Center. She will always have a special place in my heart. Uh, she's mentioned in the podcast without being mentioned in the podcast because I wasn't sure <laughs> if she wanted people in various countries to know her name. But because this is a UW Weisman event, I wanted you to know that she is an amazing hope multiplier. I um, my so back to our my personal story for a moment. I I basically broke down in front of a complete stranger named Amy. And I explained to her that I suspected my child had autism and my brother had autism. And I know the longer you wait, because I had done all this research, like the longer you wait, the less positive outcomes later on in life. And there was a six month to nine month waiting list at Weissman at the time. And I broke down in front of her and I said, I can't, I can't leave. Like, I don't know what to do. And her being a hope multiplier and realizing and getting creative and explaining to me that there are other providers in the area that could give an evaluation. And she, um, she recommended other potential providers that could help. That is the type of person that families like us need that even though years later, I'm now in a different state, it's her decision to be a little bit more creative. It would have been perfectly fine for her to say, you know what, I only work at Weissman. We're full, go figure it out. For her to get creative and give me alternatives, we would later use Weissman resources, obviously, because of you know, Madison, that's where you go and they're amazing. Um, but to have that initial evaluation and just know, and she realized in the moment the importance of peace of mind, because I, I heard this and I, I wanna attribute this properly, I can't remember the source, but I'll, it's not from me. But someone said, peace of mind is the new wealth. And she realized in that moment, that peace of mind for me was paramount. And she went the extra mile. And because of her decision, um, my son got services at a much earlier time that he normally would have and just where he is now is just off the charts and it's just one human being's decision to be that hope broker that hope multiplier um it's i appreciate her in ways she won't fully understand and if i ever do complete this book i keep start to writing and then life gets in the way i she is part of that beginning of that journey because she did not have to do it. Who else have you had in your life that you would consider to be a hope multiplier or hope broker? So there is an autism mom in Wisconsin. Uh, her daughter now is beginning to be a budding self-advocate. She's actually on the podcast as well. Um, I call her my autism mom bae because she was the first woman I had ever seen who had multiple children on the spectrum because typically it's one child. Well, now there's more, you see, you, you see a lot more diagnoses, but this is like seven, eight years ago. And 
especially I'd never seen a boy and a girl. And I walked into a therapy center, it was maybe second week or so. And I jokingly call that year, was it 2013 or 2014? I call it the year of the tear. I would just break down crying anywhere. Like (laughs) the year of the tear. And I was in this therapy center in the Madison, Wisconsin metro area. And I was crying and this lovely woman came and sat down next to me and asked me, you're new to this, aren't you? And I said, kind of. And I explained my brother, but this whole, um, this whole chapter as a mom is a totally different chapter, is totally different level. So I explained to her how um, I have this boy on the spectrum and I suspected my daughter um, and she showed me her kids and they're slightly older. And it allowed me, not that everyone's journey is exactly the same, but it allowed me to see, like physically see, because she would explain to me how they started. And even though, unfortunately we don't live in the same state anymore, but just watching them on social media, them grow. One of her children went from minimally verbal to he has a whole group of friends and just seeing where this family has gone and seeing how she's done it in such an authentic way. It made me want to get to know her and see her method and to how she was doing this. So we got to get, we would get together regularly just to walk. So we found out that our kids actually all had the same providers. So we started planning our schedules. around. (laughs) So we would have 30 minute blocks uh, twice a week and we would go walking. And then there's one time a month where we had um, a little over an hour break and we would go to this Italian restaurant, just laugh and, she got me, she understood me because she was in it herself. And that is another person who I will probably never ever forget as a hope broker. And the irony of life is when you run into a hope broker slash hope multiplier, years later, I moved to Texas and I had my own moment where I did the exact same thing to another mom. So I watched a woman drop off her child And I saw the look in her face. I could tell she was new to the journey and almost verbatim. Just like this woman asked me, I asked her, I said, are you new to the journey? And she looked at me and she just started crying. And I hugged this complete stranger. And um, her kids came over last week, last weekend to visit my kids. And that too is another example of how that that is now moved forward. And she's done that for other parents as well. So hope can, is contagious as well. If it's done authentically, like not in a way to curry favor or what have you, it's quite contagious. And when it's contagious, it's quite powerful. In my humble opinion. <laughs> well, I obviously can't disagree because I wanted to have a conversation about it. So I, 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 think, I think you sold me on it. And it, it's made me think back to, um, you know, those people that have been able to relate their struggles without make me want to help them. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'm explaining this well, but that they, they've let me know that life isn't hard, but they're not there. They, they don't want me to empathize. They don't want me to fix it. They just want me to know that they're in it with me. Mm-hmm. And those, those people are pretty special people. Yeah. And, and when, you have, when you have that member, you hold on to them and you realize its importance. Again, back to the whole, this is a lifetime exercise. So the village structure may change a bit. Like we just found out that my daughter's um, teacher is now becoming a district-wide diagnostician. And that hurt because I love her so as my child's teacher, but I realize where she's going, she's gonna make an even bigger impact. But that's an example of how a member of the village, the role may change slightly, but they're, 
they're always around. I mean, as long as they can be, as long as they're on this earth, those type of people tend to always be around and be that listening ear when you need it. Have you had any, you know, you, you've talked about a, a couple of, of parents or people that really get it, like like Amy, it, yes, totally, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, but have you come across any providers or therapists that have been able to embody that that multiplying hope and because that can be really challenging it, it it can be and it's i obviously did not go to school for that i'm a lawyer by profession but i i don't know if they have classes on um empathy or going beyond the medicine or beyond whatever healthcare practice it is because there are some i guess in medical school they call it bedside manner correct bedside manner it, there's whatever that equivalent would be should exist within this provider community i've had some amazing examples amazing examples of people that understand that and then i've had some examples that have really made me wonder did you really want did you choose to be in this profession or was it thrown upon you like what happened here so uh, examples of hope multipliers um we've definitely had them in wisconsin for sure every single person every single therapist that walked into either our little university apartment or that we met at a center i thoroughly enjoyed the way they looked at my child as more than just a number or more than just a number they can charge to insurance. Um, I've had some, uh, I've had some situations where that may have not always been the case here where I currently am. Um, unfortunately, in just some examples, this ironically happened on my birthday, but um, they didn't know it was my birthday, but it was the worst birthday gift anyone could ever give someone. So I got a call, I was at work and I was told, um, Lola, I wanted you to know that your child will no longer be at my facility. And I said, why? And they said, oh, we've been fighting your insurance for two weeks and we just can't deal with it anymore. So this is her last day. So you've been fighting insurance for two weeks and I'm just finding out today. And because you are tired, you want to drop her and you decide to call me and tell me. That is not an example of collaboration. I think the providers that get that this is a lifetime journey for a lot of families, or this is a challenging season for families, tend to not only give better care, but they're contributing richly to the mental health of the family, richly. And um, Katie put in the chat, um, relationship first, service delivery second. And I think that goes to what you're talking about is that it's about that child and that family and having that collaborative relationship is going to bring the outcomes. Um, it's not necessarily the service delivery. It has to be based in that relationship. Yes. Um, I have, we've had some amazing providers that again, due to insurance, we had to switch when we switched employers and switched insurance, but we still keep in contact with them today because of their understanding of the importance of relationship. And my kids actually think some of their therapists are like extended family members at this point. But again, I, I know it's not an easy road to be a provider. I very much understand that. But the more we keep the human and human services, I think the better off we'll, we'll all be. So I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm just totally going to dominate. So, you know, you who are on the call, I really apologize. You do not get to ask any questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, but Lola, I'm wondering if you could just give it, give us a little bit more insight into how you, is there anything else that you do as you are trying to, to be that hope multiplier 
at the same time, life is bearing down. Um, because I, you know, I think we can all sit there and go, oh yeah, that's who I want to be. That's who I want to be. And then the day takes a left-hand turn and I'm like, hope, I don't know nothing about no hope. No, 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 no. So how do you, you know, besides the being in the moment, is there anything, anything else, any other insights that you can share? Or do I just have to concentrate on that one and start to, to live it out? No, for, well, I did talk to um, a friend who just, she has a two-year-old and realized now that um, her, her child may be on the spectrum and she's going through the whole, you know, finding a developmental pediatrician process. And she asked me some, I didn't realize I was doing this. And she said, uh, Lola, you, you should be, how should she say it? You should be bitter but you're not, why? And I said, why should I be bitter? This is just, how can I put it? It's a way of being human that's often overlooked, right? So bitter isn't the word. If I'm bitter, it's more of society that puts blocks, you know, puts these obstacles in my family's way in various areas. But how I get around it is just understanding the control in a lot of ways is an illusion. So I really do believe that I try and control what I can and other things that happen along. Maybe it's just practice because I've been in this for 30 years. <laughs> Maybe it's just practice. But um, I, I do think for me, it comes down to just understanding the life that I have and doing the best within the life I'm given. So yes, things are rough. Things are really rough sometimes, but that's what I mean by the owning it. And sometimes that looks like a sudden mental health day at work. And I know I'm privileged that I could do that because I've made myself like that transparent at work. It's getting to the point where if a child has an autism diagnosis, they, somebody emails me. So I think it's just living this for so long and, re and finding ways in which I can, I can help. And there are various projects in the back burner right now that I can't necessarily talk about, but I hope I can help contribute in a way that makes life a little bit more easy for families like mine and for self and for self-advocates current and future and that's what keeps me going like the work I'm doing now uh, professionally as a lawyer is way more in line with who I am uh, I work on legal issues related to the Americans with Disabilities Act now I've never done that before that just started in January and the speaking I do and the writing I do those are my outlets and that's just uh, that's what's helped me the most i'm trying to think of another thing that i do to keep the hope going i actually i i did this what i call a a, a passion slash purpose audit like okay take out take out the mother role take out the sibling role what have you always loved to do and try and do that. So I've always been a writer. I've always been a speaker. I So I'm now doing that within the autism realm, but it thoroughly gives me joy. So when other things are going south, I tap into those passions. And then those are the type of things that keep me, keep me going. I don't know if that's a good answer. I apologize. But that's what I do. <laughs> I, you know, I think that's a great answer. And one of the things that is, is striking me now, one of the things that I'm feeling right now in the moment is the 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 hope that I feel from listening to someone who journeys in a different way than bitterness and anger and division. But that journeys in a way of village and hope and relationship and community. And that having that 
acknowledge that that exists, that there are people who live that way, is just so hopeful to me in looking at the world around me. And I think a lot of my journey is not, and again, because of the 30 years part of things, like I know the disappointment is, is there. I know that people will disappoint me because I've watched people disappoint my mom. I know that people will do really mean things to us as a form of ableism, even though I am quote unquote able-bodied, whatever that means. But I, but you know, being a caregiver, you see it in a much more intimate way. M my mom knew of someone, we had a caretaker for my brother and we found out that somebody called uh, the caretaker and asked whatever they're paying you will double it, knowing that it's very hard to find a caretaker for someone with a specific type of need. People will disappoint you and maybe because I know that, I'm almost, I don't expect my, um, how can I put this? I wanna make sure I'm saying this correctly. Disappointment for any human being is part of the journey. I think what I took me a long time to realize is the outcome does not always equal the effort. So when you're the daughter of immigrants, you're taught, oh, you just work hard and everything will automatically, all these doors will just automatically open and you just got to work 100 hours a week. It's not necessarily that. So knowing that disappointments will come and know that's built into the overall life process, it's not that it makes it any easier, but at least if you know that it's coming, it's helped me out tremendously from a mental perspective. So I pivot, there'll be some providers that are amazing, but there'll be some that are not. So how do we pivot? And I think that's also helped me move is to learning how to be agile has been instrumental to our journey. How does agility fit into all of this? Because we've had quite a lot of disappointments. Um, if our employer decides to wake up and say, I don't want, because they're self-insured, we don't want to include an autism mandate within our insurance. Like, how do we pivot? What does that look like? And my husband and I have talked through all these scenarios. And again, I know I'm privileged to even have somebody to talk to <laughs> about this and strategize with, but those are the type of things I mentally prepare myself for. So when it happens, I can just pivot. So I, I know that I, I told you that we'd be talking for around 45 minutes and I have dominated most of that with my questions. And so I really do want to leave space if there is anybody who wants to unmute and become part of this conversation. I love the, the chat going on. This is just, I, I get to have different conversations at the same time, which is really cool to me. Um, you know, but please feel free if you'd like to come off mute or put something in the chat that you'd like me to to relay to Lola. I can go. It's Katie. Um, I could listen to you honestly all day. I just think that you have just such um, amazing things to share and, and you share it so genuine, genuinely. Um, you are actually coming to speak to the place that I work. So I'm feeling very excited that I might get to actually meet you. Um, so I just wanted to, to kind of recognize you and how I just really enjoy just your take on life. And, and I just, I, I think it's awesome. So I'm so glad that you were able to put this together and I was actually able to touch base and I'll see you next month, I think. Right. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to it. It's Set up in Brown County. Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I uh, really quickly, there's a quote that I, I kind of live by, which pretty much just talks about the underpinning of my life. I have a couple of them, but one is a Mike Tyson quote. And 
roll with me here, roll with me here. It's something to effect of everyone has a plan until they get punched in the, in the mouth, right? And I think a diagnosis like this, when you don't have the resources, you don't have the community, you don't have the village and you now have to build it, um, it does feel like that, that initial like, whoa, what am I going to do? But once you fully understand the richness that lies beneath and realize part of the reason why you were so scared was because you know how society treats or will treat your loved one, in a weird way, it's more calming. It's like, okay, how can I do my part to make things a little better for not only my kids, people who look like my kids, people who act like my kids, people who look like me and my husband, people who have lived similar lives to me and my husband, those are all the things that help us keep us on the average day more in the hope category than not. Not that we don't cry, not that we don't bleed, but I believe in leading while bleeding. Oh, and I, you know, also want to, I don't know if you're able to see the chat, but Danielle says, I think hope is a critical part of the journey for parents of children with disabilities and resiliency also ties closely into that. And your story demonstrates both. And, you know, if, if you think it's appropriate, we can chat again in a few months, so we can talk resiliency um, and how you've been able to build resiliency. But um, thank you so very much for taking time out of your schedule, your work, your life um, to share a bit of hope with us. Um, I really do appreciate it. And I too am looking forward to, to hearing you again um, later in the fall um, for, for another conference. Um, I, I told them that I refuse to be anywhere else but where you are speaking. And so if they want me to room monitor somewhere else, it's not happening, just so they know. Um, and thank you all for, for being here, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording so that if there's anything you want to share um, that's not for posterity, you can do that. So just give me a moment. But Lola, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for making this a full, a full circle moment for me. Thank you. <laughs>